Hello and welcome to part six of my series of videos where I show you the PC that I'm building for 2021. Now in the first four parts of the series, I showed you the components. I showed you the motherboard, the CPU, the power supply, the graphics card, etc. to give you a better idea as to how the build will go. But in part five, two months ago, I actually built up the PC and I documented the whole process in that video. And if I crudely show you using my webcam, you can see at the right hand side of me that the PC still stands, but it does look a little bit different to how it looked two months ago, because over the last two months, I've made a couple of hardware changes and I've also faced a few problems and I've made a few modifications as well. So what I'd like to do in this part of the series is just walk you through all the changes and all the problems that I faced over the last two months. So the first thing that I want to talk about did not happen after the build, it happened during the build. And it relates to my huge Gigabyte Oris Master 1390 graphics card and my attempts to put the graphics card directly onto the motherboard itself, rather than doing what most other Thermaltake P3 owners do and use a riser and this bracket. And that's what they do because it allows them to show off the graphics card. But because I had a Thunderbolt 3 card as well, I wanted to attach things directly to the motherboard. It just was more practical for me. Now, I had actually recorded footage documenting this whole process, but I could not show you all of this in part five of the series because the audio was all crackling. It was unusable. But I'd like to explain what problems I faced. So the first problem that I faced is related to this bracket here. And this bracket is not optional. This is what you need if you don't want to use the this here, you want to attach this bracket to the case and then you can secure your graphics card, etc. And the first problem that I faced with that is down to me maybe being a little bit silly or maybe not knowing the case enough, but the bracket was actually back to front. Now you can actually use it that way, which is why I didn't think there was anything wrong, but it works better the way that it is just now and it's more secure. Now, as far as being secure, it's maybe hard for you to see just now because there's cables here, but there's three screws here, here and there's one at the top here. When I initially attached the bracket to the case, I think I'd only screwed the bottom and the top one and not the one in the middle. And I didn't think that would make a difference, but it does, it makes a huge difference. And when your graphics card is attached, if you get that third screw in tight, it really does help secure the graphics card and any other cards that you use, any, you know, a Thunderbolt card or whatever, it really does help it secure it to the case and keep it all tight in there. It's not gonna sag as much. But sagging was a problem and it was a problem that I could not avoid because I didn't have a GPU brace or any kind of stand or support for this huge graphics card that weighs about two kilograms. Even when it was secure, the graphics card would start to sag. And that clearly was an issue. I didn't want to destroy my board by attaching the graphics card. So that is why, one of the reasons why I wanted to move to this bracket system instead. But the other reason was length. The length of this graphics card it's, it's just ridiculous and it's so long and you can maybe see how it's set up now. The graphics card is so long that it, it goes to here and the fans should actually start about here. So the sheer length of the graphics card meant that I couldn't put my all-in-one cooler in the correct position. So the weight, the size, the sagging and all those issues made me go back to this bracket, which is something I did want to show you before, but yes, this is a problem that I think a lot of people will face. The weight and the size of your graphics card is something that you have to deal with. So the initial build of this PC two months ago, I would say was successful. I obviously had to update the BIOS because it's a 5000 series 5950X CPU. And I did move the bracket around and move the graphics card position around and all that. These are all kind of just issues that you face with any new case when you're trying to familiarize yourself with how it works. I would say that the PC build was quite successful. And at the end of part five of the series, I did show you the final build and I showed you how happy I was that it was working. But you may have noticed at the end of that video that it was working, but the RGB logo and the pump header for my ASUS ROG Strix all-in-one cooler, it wasn't being displayed. So that was something that I had to address. And it was one of the first problems that I tackled after I built the PC. 
So the colorful ASUS logo, which was not being displayed, is not controlled via an ARGB connection. It's actually controlled via a cable that goes to a USB 2.0 internal port. So fairly easy, but my motherboard only has two internal USB 2.0 ports, which is why I couldn't get it loaded initially. One of my ports has been used for the front panel of the case, and the other one is being used for my Thunderbolt 3 card. So I had none left, but that was an easy fix. I purchased the NZXT internal hub that gave me many more connections, and I could now power the ARGB logo on the ASUS cooler. The only problem with that hub is that it's powered using a Molex connector, which meant that when I switched off the computer, the hub was still powered, it was still on. So a little bit annoying, but that's how it worked. But it did work and I had the ARGB logo working. It was displaying and in my opinion, it looked great. It looked fantastic. I loved the, the white color scheme, you know, 360 millimeter white uh, fans with the white cable, with the white pump. All looked good in my opinion. But the problem that I faced then was that Yes, the logo was displaying and it looked good, but I could not control the colors. I couldn't change anything. Now it's not a customizable, customizable display where you can you know, put CPU temperature or anything. It's just the logo, but you should be able to change the colors. So I downloaded Armory Crate, I downloaded Aura Sync and all that. And I spent a month or so trying to get it to work. I uninstalled the Gigabyte software. I reinstalled everything. I did everything that I could. And, you know, I will say Aura's, uh, Asus's Aura Sync and all that, that RGB software is like a virus. You know, removing it normally doesn't work. You have to go into your registry to try and remove everything and it still leaves processes and files there. So I went through that whole process for a month and I could never get it to work. Nothing worked. I tried every single fix and the logo was still being displayed, but it wasn't syncing with the fans. It wasn't syncing with my graphics cards. So all the colors were out of sync. So it was very, very annoying. And when I was following one of the guides and I was messing about with it, I tried a different connection. I tried connecting it without the hub and I tried connecting it directly to the motherboard. And I put the, the header through the hub instead. When I connected it back in, the, the logo just stopped being displayed. So now I went from a logo, which looked good, that, but I couldn't control the colors, to a display that was just a mirror that got smudgy very easily. So I now could not display that logo at all, at all. Now, I published a review about that cooler and I've received a lot of comments from people and some people say it works, but many other people have said they've experienced the same issue. So I faced the same problem. I could never get the, the logo to display properly. I could never control the colors. And at the end, I just had a mirror. And in the end, I did decide to send it back. It was an expensive cooler. It was like 210, 220 pounds or something. It's not the cheapest cooler on the market. And whilst it did look great, without the logo displaying, it kind of looked pretty bad. So I eventually changed it to a different all-in-one cooler, which I will talk about later. So let's stay on the topic of flashing colorful lights and talk about my memory upgrade. These are the XPG Spectrix D60G. And XPG is a brand from Adata, a big computing company that does memory, SSDs, and a number of other things. And as you can see from the box, to get it in focus, these are RGB friendly. And if you look at the top of the box, you can see that this will work with many different RGB applications. You don't have to use one particular software with this, and you don't have to add a second application to handle RGB. This will just work with whatever RGB application you're already using. So there's two eight gigabyte modules in each of these boxes. So I've got four sticks, 32 gigabytes in total. When you take these out of the box, they don't look anything special because they're clear. But when you attach them to your motherboard, they look fantastic. And you can display pretty much any colors you want with this. You can flash them, you can sync them with your fans, with your motherboard, with your graphics card. And they do, they do look good. They do look really good in my opinion. And certainly, you know, there's a lot of really nice RGB memory modules out there, but I would say that these are one of the best, visually anyway. But I will say that I was not looking to go for RGB memory modules, I couldn't care less, if I'm honest, I, I, you know, it wasn't a priority. I was mainly focusing on speed and latency. Now, previously I was using Corsair Vengeance, they were non-RGB, and they ran at 3200 megahertz at CL16. But these run at, and bring up here, 
These run at 3600 CL14. Now, the big thing about these, and one of the main reasons I bought these, is price. When I was looking at memory modules a few months ago, there was basically a shortage. I'm not sure if that's the case now, but certainly when I was looking at memory a few months ago, it was very difficult to get the memory modules that I wanted. I looked at a lot of different options, but not only were these ones 3600, but they also had one of the lowest latency and they were also one of the cheapest available as well. Many of the other ones I looked at were a good 50 or even 100 pounds more for the same amount of memory. So I opted for these. And again, like I said, it's not just the speed, it's not just the low latency. It's the fact that this will work with any type of RGB software. So I like the fact that this will work with anything. I don't have to worry about installing a second RGB application. I'm only using the XMP profile that's got 3600 at CL14. I've not messed about with timings, I've not done anything like that, but this does have Samsung B die. So I should be able to mess about with timing later and maybe get the memory speed up to 3733, maybe 3800, maybe 4000 megahertz. If you look online, there's a lot of people that have used these memory mod modules and they've tweaked it and they've messed about with settings to get a little bit more performance from the computer. But because I've been tackling other issues over the last two months with the board and I'll talk about that later, but because I've been tackling other issues, I've just kept these running at uh, the XMP profile 3600 and CL14. But I will say, over the last two months, I have been impressed with these. They look great, the speed's great, the latency's great as well. So let's get back to the huge bracket, the huge shelf which hangs off the Thermotake P3. Like I was saying earlier on, I was unable to attach the graphics card directly to the motherboard because of its length, but also because of its weight and the pressure that it applied to the motherboard. So I opted for this instead and used its dual slot PCI Express attachment there at the end. But it wasn't ideal. It really wasn't a great solution. And the reason is I was trying to incorporate everything. So I had my graphics card at the end here, hanging off the end, and I put it at the end here rather than the middle so that I could also attach my Thunderbolt card and my capture card. So the graphics card was here and it attached via a riser cable to the X16. This Elgato capture card was in the X8 and the Thunderbolt card was in the X4. But the Thunderbolt 3 card and this capture card were connected directly to the motherboard, whereas the graphics card used a riser cable. Now the problem is that this card, the capture card and the Thunderbolt card, these cards were attached like this, and there was like one millimeter of space between this and the graphics card. So the riser cable had to go up and over in order to attach to the motherboard. It was a tight squeeze, but it did work. It did actually work. It just didn't look like it would have been great long-term for the riser cable. It just didn't look like it would be a good long-term solution. It was really squashed in there. And also when you put the glass up there as well, the GPU, you know, the temperatures would just start shooting up because it was throttling against the glass because it was so close to the glass at the end. So it wasn't an ideal solution and I was looking to do something else. So in many ways, my initial setup was perfect. I connected my graphics card using the riser cable and I could connect the Thunderbolt 3 card and my capture card directly to the motherboard. And that's not something I can even do if I connect everything to the motherboard directly because when the graphics card is connected directly to the motherboard, it's so big it covers the X8 slot that this connects to. So it was perfect. I connected everything that I wanted to connect and it was working. But in another respect, it wasn't ideal. I really didn't like how far off the graphics card was hanging and I really didn't like how squashed this riser cable was because, I mean, this isn't the best uh, riser cable anyway. It's the one that comes with the case, the Thermaltake one. And it was really squashed. I mean, it was like, no space at all. And I really didn't like the heat coming from the back plate of the graphics card going onto the riser cable. So long term, I knew I had to do something. So I had to sacrifice the capture card. And that's why it's no longer in my system. So my idea was, was to take it apart and have a little bit more room using just the Thunderbolt card and the graphics card. And in order to do that, I picked up another riser cable. And this riser cable was for the Thunderbolt 3 card. So now I had two riser cables. I had one for the Thunderbolt 3 card and one for the graphics card. And it worked, it worked really well actually. And it allowed me to put the graphics card a little bit further back. And that meant if I wanted to, I could put the glass on as well. It just looked a little bit better. There was no problems with the riser cables being stuck next to anything with heat. It was a better solution, despite the fact that I did lose my capture card.
So in this new setup, I used a Gen 3 riser cable for the graphics card and a second Gen 3 riser cable for the Thunderbolt 3 card. And it did work well. I was obviously disappointed that I couldn't connect my Elgato capture card anymore because this was functionality that I did want to remain in the system. But I do think this was a better setup because it was less squashed and it meant that the, the riser cable for the graphics card was not being pushed against that worn backplate of the 1390, which was a concern, it really was. So I was happy with this setup. So what I wanted to do at this point was test the GPU temperature when the glass is attached. So I ran the GPU at 100% just to you know give it something to work with. And when the glass is away and the graphics card is right at the edge, it sits about 52 degrees. So no problems there, absolutely no problems. But when the graphics card is right there and the glass is attached and there's, you know, there's only like a, a few millimeters there between the glass and the graphics card, it throttles badly because there's no airflow getting to the front of the graphics card for the fans to get airflow. And I was amazed at how quickly the temperatures went up. And I didn't actually see how bad it would get, but just by putting the glass on, it went from 52 degrees up to like 70 degrees in a matter of seconds. And at that point, I just took the glass off because I was worried about what was going to happen. So when the GPU is loaded at 100% and you put the glass on and the graphics card is at the front, it's, it's, it's a bad situation because the graphics card is not getting any air for the fans. Now, it's a different story when you move the graphics card back. Just by moving the graphics card back about two PCI Express slots, it was enough to drop the temperatures down to about 55 degrees. That's three degrees higher than when the glass is off, but that's actually not too bad. 55 degrees against 52 with the glass off. When I applied an undervolt, I dropped the temperatures again down to 53, only one degree higher than it was before. So what that means is if you're going to use the Thermaltake uh, P3 case and you want to use it with the glass, you need to ensure that the graphics card is at least a few PCI Express slots back. You want it in the middle or you want it right at the back and then the glass will not cause any problems with airflow, you know, save for a couple of degrees. It is something that I recommend everyone checks themselves if they do get this case and, you know, it will depend on your graphics card and all that as well. But it did show me that I could use this bracket, this shelf, I could use it with the glass on the front. I could use it with the glass on the front if I wanted to, and got, um, the GPU temperatures would not be negatively affected, not by much anyway. So I'd love to be sitting here telling you that my PC was perfect at this point, and I was not experiencing any problems with the system. But that would be a lie. About a week after I set this riser cable for the graphics card, alongside this smaller riser cable for the Thunderbolt 3 card, I started to see some problems with my system. Now, initially I thought it was only specific to one application because when I was editing videos in DaVinci Resolve, it would sometimes freeze, or sometimes the app would close and I'd have to restart the app, or sometimes I'd have to restart the system. But everything else was working okay. But after about a day or two, I noticed that even when the app wasn't open, I noticed that the mouse was freezing sometimes sporadically. And then after three or four days, I started to see many blue screen of death error messages. And at that point, I realized there was a major problem with the system. Now, anyone who's bought a riser cable before will know that these things can be problematic, but I didn't know for sure that this, you know, this was the issue. I didn't know that these riser cables were causing the problems. So I checked the memory, I knocked the memory speed down, and I checked all the connections, and I just kind of went about the system trial and error, trying to work out what was wrong. Now, you can buy Gen 4 friendly uh, riser cables right now, but they are a lot more expensive. This one's Gen 3. And if I wanted a Gen 4 one, it would have been like 85 pounds or 80 pounds instead of 30. But these ones are Gen 3. So in the BIOS, I set two different settings, the X16 setting, the PCI Express setting, not at auto, not at Gen 4, but I set both of them at Gen 3. And that's how you make sure they're compatible. But I wanted to make sure everything was okay as well. So, you know, with regard to the system, I took the Thunderbolt 3 card out of the equation. I had to get that out there. And I just connected the graphics card using this riser, and then I connected the graphics card using this riser. And it didn't fix it. Now, I didn't know at the time, but there was problems with AMD motherboards with USB connection issues. This is something I'll talk about later. And there was issues with, you know, other things with the board with AMD boards right now. 
in hindsight, I'm not sure if those things could have been the issue. But after spending a few days, uh, spending a few days tackling this, this issue and you know trying to figure out what was going on, I decided to just completely remove riser cables from the equation. It just wasn't worth the hassle. So I started again to work and I started taking away that bracket stroke shelf, which I've been talking about a lot today. And I started connecting everything back to the system, the motherboard, the Thunderbolt card, and I just took the, the bracket off. And that meant I had to move the fan to the side as well. Now, rather than repeat what I've already said, here's me talking about it about two months ago. So it seems to be more secure now. I don't seem to be having any blue screens of death, but we'll see what happens. So yeah, this is the way that I've set it up. I've moved the radiator from there over to here. It's not the most secure, but it's working. And I've got the graphics card and I've got the Thunderbolt card in as well. And I've changed those from Gen 3 to Auto. Seems to be working okay. The only thing I noticed is that when it was vertical, which is ideally the way that I want this to sit, it wasn't sitting in the PCI Express slot. It was just kind of falling out just because of the weight. I would have to get a, a stand or a GPU bracket or something, maybe a bracket to put in here to stop the sag. So if this is the way that I'm going to have it, I'm going to have to have a GPU bracket here, just something that goes underneath, something to keep this in place because this thing is just way, way too heavy. The blue screen of death issue was incredibly frustrating because I spent about four days tackling that issue, trying to find a resolution to the problem. But it has worked out for the best because it means that the graphics card is now connected directly to the motherboard. And I don't have to limit the PCI Express slots to Gen 3. I can now set them as Auto or Gen 4. And to accommodate the larger graphics card, all I had to do was move the all-in-one cooler's fans to the right-hand side, and it didn't look too bad. But I still had an issue with the weight of the graphics card. And when I initially connected it, you could see that the weight was going to be an issue. Sometimes the graphics card would just came out. It just came out because it wasn't connecting properly because the weight of the card was pulling down on the X16 connection. So I looked at resolving that and I picked up a GPU brace and a GPU stand. Now the GPU brace that I got, that brace does work well with other cards, but with my Gigabyte Aorus Master, it just doesn't sit right with it and it wasn't really giving any support at all. So I moved to a stand instead and the stand works perfectly. It supports the weight, actually supports more weight because I've got fans on the back of it. And if I jump to this webcam here, you can see that the stand is still there. And I basically just attached this other bracket. This other bracket is actually for water coolers, you know, for this case. But I'm using it to position the stand here and it supports the weight here. And I just kind of grip it with the stand here. Very cheap solution. You can pick these up for about 10 bucks or so. Very easy to use, very easy to set up and perfect for anyone who's got a heavy 3000 series card. Building a PC in 2021 is all about compromise. You can't get all the components that you want. You just have to see what stock is available and then work with whatever you can get. Now, there has been a few components that I could get that I did want. I wanted the AMD Ryzen 5950X, but even that CPU was hard to get and I had to wait about a month to get it initially. I tried to get the Dynamic XL case. I pre-ordered it in December and in January after it had been Extended a few times, I opted for the Thermaltake P3 case instead, but I have since bought the Dynamic XL case, so I'll move to that later on. Same story with memory modules, very difficult to get the memory that you want, and I'm gonna state the obvious, it's very hard to get a graphics card in 2021. And I have the Gigabyte Aorus Master 1390, not because I like its size, its length, or its LCD display. I've got that card because it was the card that I could get. I was initially looking for a 3080. So one of the things that I was looking to get was custom power cables. I really don't like these thick braided PSU cables that you get with your power supply. And the ones that I get with my Corsair EX1000 are functional, but if you've got a nice case or an open case that I've got, they really don't look great and they all kind of bunch up together as well. So I was looking for cables that were a little bit easier to work with. So I started looking at cables and I kind of landed on cable mod cables, but I couldn't get the color I wanted and I couldn't even get any cables that worked with my power supply. There was like none in stock. These cables retail about a hundred pounds. You can get them in lots of different colors, but eventually I did 
managed to pick up some power cables and I picked them up from eBay. I got them for £38 second hand and they're black and blue. Now they're not the colours that I wanted but they are okay. I quite, they're okay, they're growing on me and they're a lot easier to work with. They look a lot better than the thick black braided cables that I had initially and they weren't too expensive either. So a small modification to the system really, kind of superficial in a way, but these you know, kind of sleeve cables are a lot easier to work with and they look a lot better as well. It's just a shame that I couldn't get white or white and black or just something that complements that case a little bit better. So I did my best. I did everything I could to try and get the Asus ROG Strix all in one cooler to work with my PC. But from day one, the Asus software would not work with my system. It would not allow me to control the colors. It didn't matter how many times I uninstalled Gigabyte's RGB software and reinstalled Asus software, it did not work. And at the end, the RGB logo just stopped displaying altogether. So I sent it back and I got this. This is the Fantex Glacier 1 240MPH. And I am completely biased here because this is the cooler that I purchased, but I do think this is one of the best looking all-in-one coolers on the market today. It's got a gorgeous white color scheme and it's got these amazing halo frames with RGB and a beautiful, what they call, infinity mirror on the pump. And that infinity mirror can be taken off and put back on very easily as well. Like I was saying earlier on with the memory modules, you can control the RGB of the fans and the pump here. You can control it using any RGB software. You don't have to install any custom Fantex software, which is you know, one of the selling points of this over the ASUS. You can use this with Gigabyte's RGB software, with MSI's, with ASUS's. It doesn't matter what you use, you can control the RGB with this. So that's pretty good. But of course, if you look at the box, you can see that this is an Ace Tech product, exactly like the one that I had before. The ASUS cooler that I had was an Ace Tech product as well. So the difference here, the big difference here, because they are very similar, the big difference here is that it's a 240 instead of a 360. It's got two 120 fans instead of three 120 fans. But that's really the main difference here. But I published a full review of this, so please do check that out if you want to see you know, the installation process and my full results. But under normal usage, when the CPU is not overclocked, when my 5950X just norm running normally at 100%, I only saw an increase in temperatures of about three degrees. So there's not a massive difference between this and the 360 version. When you overclock the 5950X, that lead gets extended a little bit more. And there was maybe about a 10 degrees difference when all the cores are overclocked and you've got you know, all the, the cores running at crazy high speeds, then you did see a big difference between the 240 and the 360. But in day-to-day -day usage, unless you're going crazy with overclocking this, is perfect and I'm really happy with it. Fantastic installation process, you know, as far as the manual and all that, very easy to work with. And I love the fact that I can put this into another system easily and I don't have to worry about having to change the software or install additional software. So great little cooler, one that I can recommend. So the last few things I want to talk about are related to major problems that I've been trying to tackle with this system over the last month or so. And I've been documenting the process of these problems on my YouTube channel. And the first one relates to AMD motherboards in general, because myself and thousands of other AMD motherboard owners have been facing major headaches with the motherboard. And it all relates to, well, mostly 5000 series CPUs, but other people have said older CPUs are affected as well. But it all relates to Gen 4, PCI Express Gen 4, and USB connections. So basically, if you run Gen 4, USB ports just were not working correctly. I'm not even joking. These are Gen 4 boards, Gen 4 motherboards, and they're sold as Gen 4 motherboards. And for the last few months, my USB ports have not been working. So I've been using my Thunderbolt 3 hub instead. I am so glad that it was there. So the problem is that if you use Auto or Gen 4, there is a problem with USB connections. And this manifests itself in many different ways. For me, it meant that my cameras, my overhead camera and this camera, these cameras would not record. Like I would click record and the picture would freeze and I'd be like this. And it was a major headache. I could not run my cameras through my PC. I had to run them all through the Thunderbolt hub. So bandwidth was limited. 
For other people, it manifested itself in different ways. You know, maybe the mouse would disconnect every now and then. Maybe the keyboard wouldn't uh, connect. Maybe your audio interface would have dropouts. Maybe you'd be gaming and then you couldn't use your controller for a few seconds. There's been major problems with this, with headsets, with speakers, with everything. Anything that you connect with USB, well, it's had problems. So I did a video about this a few months ago, and eventually, after a while, AMD did acknowledge the issue. They were quite late to the game, but they did acknowledge the issue. And after about a month, they did say that they had a fix. And over the last few weeks, they have been rolling out BIOS updates, you know, from all the different companies, Gigabyte, Asus, MSI, the usual suspects. So they've been ro rolling out um, BIOS updates to fix this problem. Now, the only solution before was to drop down to Gen 3. Drop your PCI Express slots from Gen 4 down to Gen 3. And doing that did actually fix all the problems. But it also meant that if, like me, you had a Gen 4 SSD, all of a sudden your 5,000, 6,000 megabytes per second speeds went down to like 2,000, 3,000, which I know this is first world problems here, but basically my 400 pound hard drive went to become a 150 pound hard drive because I wasn't getting the speeds I paid for. So you could drop down to Gen 3, and there was a lot of other suggestions made, but really the problem was still there. So I did a video about this the other day, I've talked about it, and they have been rolling out BIOS updates, and I hope that this has been resolved for most of you. But interestingly, I did a video the other day saying that the BIOS update looks like it works now for me, and everything's working okay. And then I attempted to start this video today, uh, yesterday. I tried to do the first few clips of this video, and the problem was back again. The problem was back again. So the BIOS update, I thought initially had resolved the problem, but yesterday I could not record anything. I could not use any of my USB ports. Now I contacted Gigabyte, they actually res uh, responded quite quickly. There's another BIOS update today, and it seems like it's working. So far, it seems like this headache is behind us now. I'm hoping that it's behind us, but I suspect if you've got an AMD motherboard and CPU, it might be another few BIOS updates for us to fix everything. But it looks like there is a fix. Now, this has been a major headache from the start because it's kind of highlighted how poor the support, the support is from computing companies and also from retailers because when you told them about this issue, they just didn't care that your motherboard didn't work. But for now, it looks like this issue has been resolved. It looks like it's working. I'm trying not to speak too soon because I've done that a few times before and then it's not worked again but it looks like we're hopefully on the right track and my motherboard can actually work. I can get Gen 4 speeds, I can actually use my USB ports. Here's hoping this is the end of it. So it's pretty crazy to think that this PC has been running for two months, but it's only now that I can actually connect this camera directly to the motherboard alongside other USB devices and actually use my PC like any normal PC could be used. So I'm hoping all of that is behind us, but incidentally, the motherboard that I've got is the Gigabyte X570 Aorus Master. And I'm telling you that just for a nice segue to this. This is my Gigabyte Aorus Master RTX 1390. Different component, same branding. And whilst this USB power issue has been going on, I've been facing a different issue with this 1390. And it's something that doesn't just affect this particular model, it affects pretty much all 1390s and to a lesser extent uh, NVIDIA 3080s as well. I think water cooling cards should be okay, but it relates to the fact that video memory here overheats. So the 1390 has 24 gigabytes of video memory, VRAM, and most of those chips do tend to be at the front of the card, and there's a massive heat sink and heat pipes, etc. and you've got three fans on the front as well, which will cool things down. On the back, it's pretty much nothing. You've got your VRAM chips, you've got thermal pads, and then there's a back plate, and the back plate does not dissipate enough heat. And that leads to a lot of problems. It will depend on what you're doing though, as far as what happens, but when the VRAM chips overheat, the performance of a 3090 can drop below a 3080, you know, in a worst case scenario, which is pretty crazy that a card that's twice the price can throttle and go down to a card that's so much cheaper. But that is what's happening. And as far as what that actually does, well, if you're gaming, you might see performance drop and you maybe have 20 or 30 less FPS, depending on the game. If you're converting a video or video rendering, you're using all of that VRAM, then all of a sudden your rendering time will increase. It's going to take a lot longer to complete the task. 
If your cryptocurrency mining, which a lot of people are doing with all NVIDIA cards right now, then if this overheats, then maybe you're going to see, uh, you know, Ethereum mining wise, maybe you drop 20, 25 mega hashes. It's pretty significant and it's a problem that a lot of, a lot of us have been facing. So the best thing to do really, or two best things you can really do, um, one would be to water cool the backplate. And EK have released a backplate that's got water cooling on it so you can water cool the backplate. But of course, that will void your warranty. But another thing that you can do, which will also void your warranty, is replace the thermal pads yourself. So you need to open up your GPU, you need to replace those crappy, poor thermal pads that they use and use good ones. And I've looked at a lot of the comments from you guys and my videos about this issue and you've dropped temperatures of the VRAM by about 15 to 20 degrees. It's pretty significant, but I will say it's quite annoying. <clears throat> it's quite annoying that we even have to do this in the first place. We have to void our warranty to fix a design flaw of their own system, their own uh, graphics card. As yet, I've not done anything that could void my warranty. I've not opened the card up and applied water cooling or replaced the thermal pads on the VRAM chips themselves, but I have applied an undervolt. And I don't always have it applied, but I do have a profile on MSI Afterburner and I can apply an undervolt whenever I'm gaming or I'm doing any kind of video work where I'll be using a lot of VRAM. And doing that will obviously send less electricity to the VRAM chips, less electricity, less heat to cool. So it does make a significant difference. Now, the VRAM temperature, when you monitor it, only shows you up to 110 degrees because that's where it throttles. And you really don't want to go over that because performance will start going down pretty quickly. So what I did initially was I put some thermal pads down on the back plate and then I put some heat sinks on it. Now, I published a few videos about this. I did a few different configurations and it does seem to help at least two to four degrees. It depends on your setup and it depends on the ambient temperature in your room. But... I did see changes of about two, two to four degrees when I applied heat sinks in the back of the GPU. And it's really just because the backplate alone is not dissipating enough heat. But I didn't stop there. I also put two 120 millimeter Noxua fans on the back as well. I'd previously been using a different fan, a kind of 240 millimeter fan that ran at 1000 RPM. But when I put on the Noxuas at 2000 RPM, they're fairly quiet still, but they do either put a lot of air onto the GPU or exhaust a lot of air. And I probably dropped another four degrees from the VRAM temperature by doing that. So I went from 110 or over 110 down to about 107. And then I went all the way down to about 103, 104. But obviously those temperatures can change depending on the temperature of your room and you know other factors such as the case that you're using. And that's another problem that I've obviously faced because my graphics card is not in a closed PC case with a lot of cold air circulating. I've got it in the Thermaltake P3, it's an open case, and there's no cooling for the graphics card. And that's one of the reasons why I will be moving this whole PC to the Dynamic XL case. I'm going to have 10 fans spinning in that case. I'm trying to make it like, you know, like an iceberg in the middle. And I want to get it cooled because I do think that once that PC is in the case and I've got a lot of intake fans, I reckon I could drop temperatures even more by about four or five degrees. I'll wait and see what happens though. And it, I will say it's been really interesting looking at all your comments, all of the, the changes that you guys have made. You know, looking at what you guys have said, water cooling does help. Replacing the thermal pads will drop by about 20 degrees as well. But hopefully if I can drop another five degrees just by putting this PC in the case, you know, with more airflow, then I probably wouldn't go down the replace the thermal pads on the GPU route so that I don't have to void my warranty. And it's annoying, it is annoying that you even have to do this anyway. You shouldn't have to void your own warranty to fix a design flaw, but it is what it is. But that is a problem I've been facing, and I think it's something that everyone who has a 1390 or 3080 has to tackle. So there it is, guys. This has been all the problems I've faced and all the hardware changes I've made since building this PC two months ago. I hope you've enjoyed the video. And I think this video does demonstrate that even once you've built a PC, you might face some teething problems after the initial build, maybe with software, the BIOS, or with some hardware configurations as well. Now, for me, I think most of my hardware problems came from the fact I was using the Thermaltake P3 case, and I was using a lot of components that I wasn't really intending to use. 
The Thermotech P3 case is normally just used with a graphics card. Most people don't connect two additional PCI Express cards, the Thunderbolt card and the capture card. Most people just have the graphics card, so they wouldn't face all the problems that I faced with the riser cables and different things, trying to get everything connected. Even with the GPU, I was initially looking for a 3080 FE. It was the right size, it was the right weight. It didn't cover the X8, but as you know, there's a shortage of graphics cards. I took whatever I could get, and that's why I made a number of the changes that I did. Certainly, if I had to do it again, maybe I would have waited for a different case, maybe I would have waited for different components, but I worked with what I had. As far as the other issues that I faced, well, I think riser cables are something that can be problematic, but a lot of the problems I've had have came from AMD's USB power issues and the 1380 graphics card overheating, which is maybe a problem I would have faced with the 3080 anyways, but I've got there and, you know, the PC is built now. This is how it's been for the last few weeks and it's not going to be like this much longer because I am going to move that PC into another PC case, one that's got better airflow. So please stay tuned for that video. But I hope you have enjoyed this series of videos. I hope you've got a better understanding as to the whole build process. I will do one more video in the series where I look at the Thermotake P3 case as well and just talk about my experience with building with this case and talk about what I liked and what I didn't, you know, what I didn't like. But I hope you've enjoyed the video, guys. Thanks for watching. If you've got any questions, please do post them below. And until next time, take care.